That is the wrong camera. Why is it that camera? Should be on the other camera. Hold on, I'm trying to figure out where this went. Is it this one? I thought you were a pro. I, like I was for a second you know there. This it's this one! Speaking of which, I'm like, I'm trying to figure out how my why my mouse won't connect to my thing. Let me see if I can, one second. I hate not having a mouse. Like, I hate using the... Let me move my monitor to up there. Oh, that's what's happening. This is kind of better. Okay, so what? I guess I guess you're not going to see me because I am trying to record. And it's doing the thing where it's like you're trying to record your screen at the same time. That's not awkward. Yeah, I'm... Mm. Hold I'm on, okay I've got... No, I've got a spare webcam. I'm going to yank it over here. Give me a second. <laughs> Do it. Let me see if I can. It's like professional oh as they may be, I've never done an interview before. So all this like figuring out what's going to work and not is new. <laughs> it's just like hanging out. I can't do my studio is such a mess right now. Like it's brutally messy. I've been trying to like I've had no time to even. Think about creating anything. So I'm like, I'm just barely getting by right now. Stepping on all my cords and shit. You're going to see me from a weird angle, but there it is. <laughs> Pro angle. You never, never seen me from that high up. I'm usually like, my main camera is like over here. So it's... From my lofty lofty chair. and <laughs> yeah. Sitting high above me as you should. <laughs> Nerd. Uh... Dude, I, I, wait, have we actually talked? We haven't actually talked on the we phone. We haven't actually right? talked, no. Sweet. Now we're doing it. Oh, look, my hair looks so gray in that fucking light. <laughs> what is happening? It's just my st my studio. I look, like, I look so pale in this. Like, there's no color to this camera at all. It's very, like, gray neutral on color tone. I look so dry and dead. Well, you can color correct your your tan and then my... My grays out too. Well, that's like kind of why the cameras are having issues because I'm recording on my good one that is like properly calibrated. And this is just uh, a, a streaming webcam that is usually just a side angle that I used to use on Twitch. So it's just kind of like not prepared for all of this. All good. This camera quality right. is actually really good. Here, let me put it on full screen. Sweet. Look at that. It works. There we go. Okay. Ideally, everything I did test earlier, the recording of like, I'm using two different copies of OBS running at the same time. And I was okay. like, I don't know if that's going to work <laughs> in recording. But it what does. is OBS? Is that like, oh, a... it's, uh, it's a recording software. It can be used for streaming or recording anything, really. So a lot of people use it for YouTube, Let's Plays, pretty much everything. I use it for YouTube stuff because I'm already so familiar with it by doing uh, stuff on Twitch and streaming games and drum stuff over there. So it's like, use it for YouTube because most people do anyway. <laughs> I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Hold on, let me close my so you can see my logo. Oh, it's yeah. There yeah. <laughs> it is. Gotta have that going. So, anyway, Kubo, yeah. are you like a big fan of that? Of uh, the Kubo? I mean, I'm just a fan of animation. I love stop motion, but it was just a, yeah. uh, a gift from a friend, and it was like, hey, it per fits perfectly on the wall. I, have I a, love stop motion. Too, I have a right. Zelda poster that's over on that wall. It's like I switch them out once in a while whenever I get bored of seeing one. <laughs> it's just been a while since I've swapped them. I haven't really decorated my studio all that much since I'm since we bought this place a couple of years ago. This used to be yeah. my garage, like one of my garages. Oh, but... so you just like hey, I'll repurpose the extra space and turn it into a Yes. I'm actually kind of planning on doing that with this room in the next few months. I've got plans on like doing uh, some better sound treatment to the walls and getting it like more ready. I want to put an acoustic kit in here. I miss playing acoustic. I want to get mics back in here and actually do proper uh, real drums. I, I love my electronic. I built that thing literally by myself, but it's also, I miss the feel and the dynamics of playing an acoustic. So it's like, I just want to get back to doing that. I think it would be more fun to do drum covers with that too. So yeah. 
I agree. I I love. Uh, I don't and I don't even really have any drums, but I do have this. I'll show you. Super cool. I just recorded oh, it. Oh man. The toilet. Dude, I and I, I love like, drums from just a world percussion is so I rant about that all the time in videos. <laughs> I get it, dude. I was trying to like, so I had to like record some of it because I used to play in this Polynesian band. And you can get some pretty cool <laughs> tone out of it, right? Yeah. So different spots of it. Yeah, it's like depending on how you use the mallet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get some cool stuff. So I love yeah. that. But we were doing it's... some like Polynesian stuff um, for Overwatch. And oh, I had to like yeah. record some actual like drums. So that was fun. Right. And then I have my bongos here, but then I have a ton of like these flutes, like native flutes. Mm, that was getting that one's actually getting peaked out. It wouldn't even go through on the mic. Really? Yeah. Maybe I'm too close. Let me see. Uh, you know, I think it might be Discord because it does have some sort of a uh like a sound control setting in it like it tries to get rid of white noise and background noise automatically oh um, so it's just it's just telling you that i'm a shitty flute player it's like <laughs> it's just like you we don't want that culture get that out of here <laughs> yeah. Dude, uh, it's racist they're like that's, that's how island. fitting that discord would be racist i know right <laughs> oh the We're app for gamers <laughs> <laughs> oh, just to man. name each other i love it Anyway, <laughs> so what what do you have in mind for today? So I actually wanted to ask you specifically, uh, I've got a video I'm working on about uh, the song Springs Pulse. I, you didn't work on that one, but uh, it, it was from Ark Nights. And it was a song that for some reason really hit this like nostalgic note in my head. So I've been like working okay. on this kind of deep dive about it and working out some of the music theory behind it and doing what research I can. Nice. And I, through what I've learned, I'm not a music theory person and not a composer, but I'm pretty sure it was done in E major. All right. And yeah, so I was, I was going to either send you the link or if you wanted to like look it up so you can at least get a, get a yes. feel for what it is. Let me see. It was around like one minute in is okay. when like I hit the specific spot. It's this like little mini solo of notes. It's a, just a, a measure or two in there that like really hit me. Yep. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, that sounds so pretty. <laughs> yeah, it's I a like, nice flute. I, I feel really like, like I was, I was like stolen that experience the first time. Couldn't hear it. <laughs> Do you think we could jam like this? Probably. Well, with the delay, not so much. But. <laughs> oh, you just did Undertopia. Yeah. OG. People oh, have been asking for that for a while. So it's an E major. Okay, I was right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I was so worried I wasn't right. Yeah, that measure right there, that spot right there is what got me. Then to E. It's going E to an E over G sharp and back to A. That's so cool. Do you like, I guess that's kind of the crux of my question with this is like, why do you think that that hits such a note for me? Oh, I, I mean, I'm I sure it does for a bunch of people, but. Mm -hmm. So that, I love it too. It's very Broadway. That might be it. So that dun, dun, because from going from E to the G sharp to the A is a really like emotional uplift, right? So you start you're starting out. I mean, we're in E, we're in E, right? So when you start on that the four, you're already like you feel like you want to move somewhere because when you st when you start from the four, that's like a subdominant. So that's like there's a million worlds where the four can go from too, right? So we're on the sub, and it's got that uplift, the five, which feels like that, like you want to go to one, right? Like 
dominant to tonic. So from the yeah. A to the B, and then it, it fools you and goes to the minor. And then from the six, it hits the one. So there's the tonic, and then it's like a third back to the four. So I I love that change. That's like a very like Broadway thing. That's <laughs> You know what I mean? And that's yeah. exactly what he's doing here. But let me let me go back. Who wrote this one? Oh, that's beautiful. Masaru Yokoyama. Yeah, he's worked on a bunch of anime stuff. And like uh specifically, I bring up um like Your Lie in April, which was like a very music it focused on a pianist and a violinist falling in love it makes sense like he would know that he's ready he's pulled those heartstrings in his past so it kind of tracked that this composer would be like i know exactly what to hit <laughs> so I I, that. that's super i cool. love that so it's I love that. This, yeah, it's so pretty. Like, there was just something about, like, during my reaction to it, I heard that violin section come in with just the the single notes going up, and I was like, oh, like it kind of gave me a flood of like this nostalgic wave that I couldn't quite nail down as to why it was. I'll tell you also what's interesting about this. That's interesting. And he does he does that like he does that like uh, major um, six or or is that what, wait let's see what key are we in we're in E so yeah major six major flat six that's very anime so he's got this <laughs> section where he's like. Yeah, and because then you can also step up back to the tonic as major. So from that ma that six major, you can go to the D major chord, and then hit the A the E, right? So what else is driving about this that's really fascinating to me is is it's cyclical. There's a circle there, and anytime you create a chord change pattern where you end up on the tonic or end up where you where you started, it gives you this circle vibe that's almost like constant building emotion right so he's doing this um so he's like mm. and so and so that constant circle six or four five six one three four five six one, da, da. Why, you know, so there, there's a specific song that that's reminding me of what is that now why is that? I, I'm getting another one of those floods of like, there's something in the the back of my head. It's there's something in there. It's like it. I've heard that yeah, it's, before. It's or a common something, chord progression. Yeah. So there, there's another chord progression that I love that um, that does a similar thing that you probably would like. That um, yeah. <laughs> mm. Or you can flip that and go F to E minor to A minor to G F E minor C G I I think what it might be is just the the raw feeling of bittersweet that comes with it. Maybe there's something about that that is like resonating me with so hard. I can't fully nail it down but i think like something between the nostalgia and this bittersweet memory that is sitting in the back of my head that i can't quite fully pick up on why but that's that's what those chords are doing for me at very least mm -hmm. that's where they're hitting me is like this feeling that i wish you know like man I miss those days. I wish things were better. You know, like th mm -hmm. that general pocket of emotion. I'm very much a, a feel player and yeah. a feel musician. I've never really been too much for the the technical side of things while I do understand it. 
Mm-hmm. I've I've also never really like grasped it to that degree. I've never studied or any of that. So it's like when I feel things in on the drums, same thing as I just play and I just go with what feels right. I think that's valid. Yeah. Another interesting thing that you that is in there that you might like is when they take a major chord and invert it so that the third is the is the root and then they put that in the middle. So if I was going to play F G and then I wanted to go to E minor that's great, but what if I if that E minor became a C over an E? So Weird. instead of a minor, I like right, it. <laughs> so the chord change is Or you can do that with with an A minor, but make it an F over an A minor. So you're inverting that F. So it feels like an A minor. So it's like this. Now ready? Here it is. And then do the same thing with G over B. So F. Yeah. F over A, G over B to C, and then E minor to F. So you get that. It's got the same drive. You know, it's like that. Yeah, it's like that Broadway thing. I'm it's definitely just- getting the, the lift out of that for sure. Like, it just constantly feels like you're being pumped with more. <laughs> you're just like, oh, there's yeah. something more happening. It's every single time you landed on the chord, I was like, oh, oh. Yeah, <laughs> that whole thing. It's, maybe, it's a little to see a little Broadway. It's just maybe, I, think I was about cool. to say maybe I'm feeling Dear Evan Hansen out of that actually. Sure, I mean I bet. And, and, I can mm. tell you from working with Pascal and Paul that they do like the the compound chords. Yeah, like, I I, I was also thinking potentially could have been for good from Wicked, but that might just be me. <laughs> oh, that that was a little. Yeah. Yep, that's the E over C. Okay, I'm not crazy. Hey! <laughs> F. Wait, so. Something like that. Yeah, yep. There it is. <laughs> we, did, we did this whole, um, have you been recording all this? I'm not even paying attention. Yeah, I have. I've just, I've been recording okay. since the start of it. But it's all good. I love it. Um, we did a whole like wicked slot machine a couple years ago for oh. Zynga. And I had to redo. So we actually hired Shoshana Bean, who was um, Alphaba on Broadway, to <laughs> sing. And I got to do all new arrangements of the oh. stuff from Wicked, and I still have them. And I like, I love that show. I we, was I, about we, to say, how did you pull for good out of your back pocket so quick? You were just like, I got it. Hold on. Oh, there it is. Oh, I love theater, so I always get like Sondheim. Like, there's things that I just yeah. remember from years of playing. That you know that I just yeah. I, you just but I also am playing by ear. I mean, yeah, of course. That's about all I'm good for when it comes to like figuring stuff out is I'm like, was that? It's weird because I don't have any degree of like perfect pitch. I can't like go, oh, that's this. But I can hear something and then repeat it or find a note in that chord. That was Mm kind of where I shined when I did like Broadway and like show theater. I was in a, a, a troop choir in high school and like we all had to be pretty decent at finding our own chords because it was purely acapella so it was like yeah we have to work together and develop an ear that works and you know um relative pitch is a really important thing and it's pitch memory is like to me what makes or breaks your concept of of musicality you know like if i wasn't able to do like pull like even even i was thinking um that other song from wicked Yep. Um, define gravity. Yeah. Right. And it, it that does same chords. 
as almost same chords as for good. But because I'm able to hear the interval intervalic relationship, I can take the same thing and move it anywhere. You know, and transpose and then, on the spot. Yeah, and that's like a different part of the song. Like that's basically the the final reprise of Defying Gravity is that bigger variant that's just mm -hmm. like, let's bring it all to head, babe. <laughs> I and I love that ascending chord pattern. I think it's like it's so nice to end, end on that suspended four. It's another I mean, one I'm of those things that just it, it resolves, but it still feels like oh, there's more. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the I, four doesn't. The four can go anywhere. I, I the, the four to me is like the most magic chord, the subdominant, because the the way that that subdominant functions, where you can replace it with like a million different things. If you think about like like the way that a subdominant functions in relationship to like a diminished chord, for example, a diminished chord, a fully diminished seventh, can resolve up half a step from any one of the four notes in it, right? So if you're playing like a C, C, E flat, G flat, A, you can go to uh, D flat, E, G, or B flat, both major and minor. So there's four different places you can go that become the subdominant or that, you know, make, it, make that the subdominant also. So I can do like this. Right. And do like that G flat diminished to a G diminished, I mean a G7. And it feels like, feels like New Orleans. But then yeah. I can take the same chord, G flat, and now I can, instead of going to the G7, I can go to the B flat seven, and then to an E flat. So I can do this thing, I mean to an F. Oh wait, shit, I'm out of it. <laughs> B flat resolves to E flat, I'm dumb. <laughs> so yeah, so the same thing, G flat. See, or I can take that G flat diminished and go to D flat. And then from a D flat resolve down to an A flat. So. Oops. Shit. There it is. So. But that still works. Right. It's, it's just this sense that because it's the four, you can basically have all of those notes to set off from and start a new yeah. end there. And the, But that same chord, that G flat, I can resolve up to an E7 from the, because there's a D or an E flat in it, so I can do this. Right? The same hmm. thing. It's yeah. all from the same chord. So. Or it's all the same right. thing and like earlier when you were working through the chords and you were like wait no i'm wrong this resolves to an e in my mind i heard the e but i couldn't tell you where that would be like when you were talking you were like bam, bam. i'm like it goes to bam. <laughs> yeah because it's, yeah because that dominant seven the dominant or takes you there right yeah. it's the same chord. just like yeah. that but, so that, but, but and then you go. I mean it's just, so cool how that goes so many places yeah I guess that's kind of the secret to music in general like when you're writing stuff and you can just go I I how have people not written the same exact song before and like of course forgiving the stereotype of like the four chord song and like mm -hmm. all that stuff where it's like yeah the things that are popular or things that are uh generally going to be copied a bunch because that's just how mass produced music tends to work over time yeah. there's yeah. still so many wares to go you you don't just sit down mm -hmm. and go I only have this many options even though there are so many chords there's still so many ways to connect all those together. This sounds like the most basic way to wrap up that thought. <laughs> That's the most like I finished fifth grade <laughs> like yeah. way to understand music. But I guess I find some sort of a, a I don't know. It, it, I'm happy that I realize that, I guess. But it's like. I know that I'm not quite to the level where I'm just like, yeah, this this makes sense in this technical aspect. I can't like fully process to that degree, so I'm happy I'm just where I am. <laughs> Even I'm just like, it's My cool. I get it, kinda. I like music. Yeah. I don't really, 
I don't get a chance to delve into it like this. So whenever it happens, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I mean, I live it every day, but I love it still. You know, the thing about that, I was going to mention that access of awesome and the four chords thing. Mm -hmm. That's It's fun because they can wedge so many songs over those chord progressions, but they're not yeah. accurate. Like it's not real, right? Like yeah. you go back and you look at those four, the four chords and they just happen to work because the four chords that they pick take the place of most of the chords. I mean, when you think about it, there are, oh, my wife's calling. There's, hold on, let me, let's yeah, answer. Yeah, go, take, yeah, go ahead. But yeah, so they, they wedge, because if you think about the way that a major scale works, there's three major chords and three minor chords, right? So mm -hmm. if you were to play a melody, like Mary Had a Little Lamb, and play it like over the one and four. But then you could change the chords on it and to like almost any other diatonic chord and it'll work. Right. Right, and, and it's, it's, it's gonna be- like just if the that note that you're playing alone is within that chord then it'll work so yeah. you can kind of do whatever you want yeah so they kind of fudge it a little bit with those mm -hmm. four chords um and and if you really go through and listen you hear that a lot of it is just wrong they're just like <laughs> singing, they're just like singing the melody over those four chords and it just happens to like work but yeah. they're picking songs that have like relatively like happy or upbeat or major kind of sound. And that they're would picking, already kind of be like that. Yes, and they're picking a very specific part of the song that works over that. So like if they throw in Can You Feel the Love Tonight, which they I think they did. They did, over yeah. that, <laughs> that song is... Right, and, and... And that's not four chords. That's like almost all yeah. the chords. <laughs> That's the whole piano. <laughs> but you can put that same melody over four chords. Right, or you can just change it to anything in the diatonic scale that is relative to it and it'll work. And I think what they're doing is Something like that, where it's right. like, it, it still works, but it's not the same thing as. Yeah, they like remove the entire chunks of the chords that are going in. Yeah, oh no, one million percent. And so, I'm pretty sure some of those songs, they even just transpose down or up, depending. Because like, yeah. not all of them are for male singers. So I think mm -hmm. they moved them down a little bit to sing some of them that were just a little out of range. Which yes. is easy to do yeah. if you're transposing a song. You can basically make it whatever you want to, frankly. Yeah, so they they probably just made lists of songs. They're like, let's take these four chords and see what we can sing over them, and then it works. But it's not always it's not always accurate. And I think that yeah. kind of gives people the wrong idea about the way that songs are crafted because, yes, there's only 12 chords in a major scale, and, yeah, most pop music doesn't divert too far from that. But the combination of rhythms and harmonic motion like mm -hmm. harmonic rhythm the way that the chords move and when they move and how fast they move um and then you know melodic rhythm and phrasing it's like yeah. there's billions so of many variants yeah. so you know for people to say oh there's only so many chords yeah but there's only so many colors but there's billions of shades right i and even remember doing that years ago uh my brother and another friend and I, we all just sat around in a circle and like my brother had his guitar. I had, I was sitting on my cajon and we were like, let's do a four chord song. And we just literally took whatever songs came to mind and like two of them worked. <laughs> it, oh, it, it like, and that's where it was like the first realization that, oh, this isn't how music relationship works. Cause like I was maybe in high school then it was probably like late junior high early high school so i like i yeah. wasn't really into that understanding right. yet i just liked music and i was like let's go and yeah yeah it's it's that sort of wake-up call of oh there's more to this and then it was like kind of that moment where i was like i need to figure out 
more about this and understand it to a deeper degree. And that's why I got more into musical theater and doing choir. I had already stopped band by then just because concert band wasn't for me. I, I yeah. didn't want to be stuck behind a snare my whole life. Like I was like, no, I've got to have the kit. Like I'd already been playing the kit. I was mm-hmm. super a kit drummer. And while I've opened up my mind to the other options since then, it's mm-hmm. just that was my my root was like drums. The kit yeah. was what I liked, but I didn't know even in that degree what I was doing. I was just smacking things with sticks. And I still say that that's all I do is hitting stuff and not understanding really what I'm doing. I just yeah. listen and copy. And now I'm getting more used to understanding those like rhythmic dynamics and in just regular music not even specifically with drums as the focus and that's why doing the reactions was so unique to me because i started listening to more music and i was like there's so much i don't know yet (laughs) and i started to like do more research after i recorded videos and trying to understand talking to you today is part of that it's like i'm learning i didn't ever think that i was gonna be this deep into it but Mm -hmm. i i'm realizing that as time goes on and I'm getting more and more into it, I was like, man, why did I wait so long to like start falling in love with the process of music? I don't know if I'll ever be a composer. I don't know if that's really in the cards for me, but at the same time, there's no reason I can't try to be a musician, I guess is where like I landed. My relationship with music was very turbulent at first. And now I'm just like, I'm going from the the idiot stereotypical drummer who's just like, yeah, I'm going to hit the drums and go home. And now I'm like, how does this song work? What what are the the intricacies of this design that I'm listening to? It's art in sound. And I don't know how to process that even at my age. I'm, I'm working on it. Well, the good thing about being a drummer is that not only are you probably the only one in the rhythm section that it's okay for you to constantly make up your part. Even, you know what I mean? Like you always have an opportunity Mm -hmm. to do your own parts, but you play such a wide timbre of instruments in the drum set. You know what I mean? That, that you are effectively creating little orchestrations when you're building color and rhythm and pattern. Yeah. So many people, when I used to do live stream, uh, like uh, people could just request whatever, whether or not I knew the song and I would just, play to it and try my best while like actively listening and and for Mm -hmm. the most part i wasn't that bad at it people were like hey you're playing this pretty well or like i wrote this song i'm gonna have you play it and i'm like Mm -hmm. all right bet so i I would try and i would do okay and they'd be like how did you do that so well and i'm like i don't know but i also plan to get a keyboard in here at some point soon oh nice i actually have old recordings of me just sitting on those pianos and just playing random connections not a lot of them work but it's still this memory of like that was like the roots of me getting interested in music and still just without any training of any sort or any real knowledge on the subject i didn't have a piano teacher i was just guessing and learning (laughs) and i guess at that point and you don't have to be good at it to be able to to access that part of it you know yeah just you hit something and you're like that sounded neat can I do more? <laughs> I yep. and that's what I was saying. Um, I never knew I I never thought I would be a a composer or anything, but like I did give it a shot for a short time. And like years ago, I made an old uh, like music box melody, and I still to this day think that that's pretty pretty nice. But I just. Mm-hmm. I never kept going. I never kept like, I never stayed with the baton in hand. I just kind of put it down gently and walked away for whatever reason. Like it was like my magnum opus right there. I'm out. Like (laughs) why I did that. You're one and done. (laughs) What what really threw me off is like that. I did that for a, like a fandom related piece because it was kind of inspired by a character. Mm -hmm. And years later, somebody re-uploaded it. And then I found that when I was seeing if it was still out there somewhere. And there was a bunch of comments on it. Like, I loved this song when it came out. I remember listening to this and I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> like there, people actually liked this. I thought I was just throwing it into the ether. Like, I'll never hear this again. Bye. Yeah. But people listened to it and actually had like a response, be it emotionally, like, or whatever else. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's pretty magical. 
we get we get hit up like that sometimes for old stuff too that I forgot I even did, and people will ask if we had done you know the work on a certain game, and then I'll and then I'll listen to it again and I'm like oh that wasn't so terrible because stuff that I'd done like 15 years ago I don't want to hear it again <laughs> you know I try to avoid it all but every once in a while someone's like hey remember when you did bakery story for like whatever I'm like oh god <laughs> yeah. yes. Insert random like, that was my childhood. Game. Yeah, I'm like your childhood has been polluted by me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> or like this game we did, Eden World Builder, which we did that game forever ago, and I literally wrote the score in like three hours, just improvising on piano. And people are still like, and I still get hit up by that developer to do stuff because he's like a passion project developer. So mm-hmm. you know, but people always say that reminds me of when I used to play. But it's nice that people can resonate with it. But there's always going to be someone that's going to be into, into your art. Right. So, no, I guess you probably more modernly, at least get a lot of people from the Arknights and like mobile game space there. I'm sure Mm -hmm. you haven't heard the end of this is me being brought up and I'm sure you never will. (laughs) Yeah, that that's an interesting one because it's not even something that I wrote, you know, and I, I do like the work I've done. I had done on it and it was surprising to me when it made it into the film. Um, But yeah, I mean, like, I've grown a lot as a producer since then and as a songwriter, and I grew a lot from that experience. So right. um, I appreciate all of it, every every stepping stone and every project, even though some of them are older and, and I don't want to, like, go back and listen to them again. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely re-listen to the Knight stuff almost more than anything. That and Disney, I think, and Blizzard. Those are the three that I go listen to a, a lot of just because... Um, I'm really proud of where the production is for the Arknight stuff, especially because I they kind of give me free reign just to kind of do how I want to do. Right. So it's nice yeah. that that's validated by uh, the fans and stuff and by the company. Yeah, and <laughs> it's kind of uh, a mild pivot on the Arknights thing, at least. Did you see the... I, I doubt you saw that, actually, but the, I did a uh, a bounty for doing a band cover of Phenomenal Agents. You did? And that, I yeah, and that, that, that actually got funded. So I have to find people to play with, and we're going to do like a whole mm. band, like me and a bunch of internet music friends, and we're going to try to do our best to do it justice. And I didn't know that was a you song until after I'd already put out the bounty initially, like, hey, if we get this, I'll do this. And yeah. then I found out it was you, and I'm like, man, Adam's following me everywhere. <laughs> like, Those chord changes... Away. Are um like from three to one contact this old TV show that I used to watch <laughs> when I was a kid, and the melody used to go. Yeah, and I loved it. So um, so phenomenal agent isn't too far. You know what I mean? It's like it's very very similar drive. And oh yeah, I, I could I could hear it in the first version. <laughs> I was like, oh, that hey, vintage, yeah, I can see that kind of like vintage like eighties seventies, but it's supposed to be sixties. But even back then, the the you know progressive music stuff was moving around to. at that point. Yeah. It's well, like, yeah. I mean, and also there just wasn't a lot of space. There was a lot of time for people to digest things because now, like, as soon as something is released, the day it's released, everybody hears it. And then, you know, the next day, someone else is releasing something new. So the music changes really fast now. Yeah. But back then, it didn't change that fast. Right. So it would take like a decade or something for like a full shift in sound. Even longer. Like with yeah. class, that's why classical music lasted for like 100 years. Mm-hmm. Baroque music, you know, 100 years plus. Because it just, there was no way to share ideas that fast. But now that people can share ideas so fast, we're getting like a wild array of everything. It's like maximalism to the extreme. Like everybody (laughs) can just do whatever and it's okay. You know what I mean? There's really not innovation. It's just combination now and just like make and songwriting is the innovation. To me, it's like how quality are the songs? And if they're not quality, it doesn't matter what the production's like, right? right? That's why you can sit down and play most songs like guitar and piano and know right away if it's a crappy song or not just because... (laughs) It's like, it, does, it's it, does it pull you in? Yeah. yeah. It's like you can immediately tell, like, there's no soul in this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
and I think that's always kind of been like, this is a little bit schmoozy for me to say this to you, obviously, but it's like, I think that's what's always kind of brought me into the songs that you've produced that I've heard where I'm just like, these all sound like you're putting your whole soul into each one of them. Even if you're not, I feel like that's just your experience talking more than anything. Like, and I don't know how involved you get when you're making a lot of these, but it feels like you are all the time. It feels like the production and the intent are matching. And that's kind of rare to me, I guess, at least in the, uh, the pop space, even though I don't really listen to much pop either. (laughs) I totally get that. I mean, I do everything myself, like literally everything. Yeah. Everything. And so, um, the only thing that I don't do is like play the violin and guitar because I don't play those instruments or, you know, but even the, even the vocal arrangements and stuff, I'm singing all the parts in before the singer does. So I have versions of all of these songs where it's me singing everything, like (laughs) literally everything. And I'm just used to doing it that way because I've always wanted to just be able to demo my stuff fast. So I've always done it, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, completely the only one really doing anything i you know there's there's been a couple of times i take it back there's been like one or two times where i've had my friend yoris do some drum programming Mm. like i'll have him because he's a really great electronica producer so sometimes i need like a few layers so like for jellyfish boy which i think is called yk1 or y1 i forgot but they changed the name but it was like the jellyfish boy tune um, that's instrumental, and I had Yoris do a bunch of drum programming on that. And so I took his loops and I cut them up and stuff. But to me, it's like just having someone custom be able to like give you something a little more tuned to your work. Because ultimately, I'm still like mixing and cutting stuff up and doing that whole right. thing. Right. And I feel um, like that's probably why you're do you do stuff like you get uh, with Morning Dew and having that drummer uh, and like. It just you ask people to record for the parts because it's like mm-hmm. you can do it with program drums and sample packs but mm-hmm. there's definitely that loss of uh humanity in the drums if you're not doing it on an acoustic kit there's yeah. a lot more flavor there you get the the groove really it's like for you sure can, you can pretend that there's a groove but there's mm-hmm. definitely a different feel when there's a person behind an actual kit playing. Yeah. It. No, and also just the surprise of what they're going to send back, right? Because I know with the string parts and stuff, I'm going to get back the string parts I send. Mm. But when I send something to like my guitar player, Jeff, or Kane, or to a drummer, um, Adam Alisi, in this case, on most of the stuff I do these days, um, I'll send them something that I've programmed and then send them the MIDI file. But then I'll tell them, you know, like the fills to make them better Mm. or to like make certain parts more aggressive or to not make it sound like I programmed it. You know what I mean? But having musicians that surprise you is the reason why I work with certain people. Um, When I work with Josh Plotner, the woodwind player, um, especially like on Mortal Eye and stuff, I just a lot of times will tell him what instruments I want Mm. and to improvise parts. And then I'll take his and then he'll give me a ton of stuff back on a bunch of different instruments and I'll cut it up and process it and use things like a custom library. Sometimes I'll have him play actual things like if I'm writing an orchestral tune and I need like, you know, a flute part or a clarinet part or whatever, then him or Kristen Nigus, who is a really awesome uh, wind player. Also, Kristen is just like amazing classical player um she can actually improvise and do a lot of crazy things too but she doesn't play jazz so i switch between her and josh when i'm working on stuff because a lot of times i need improvisation like a like heavy right. improv just the, because the way i work yeah. um but you know i i love being surprised by that stuff it really does make my job more exciting because you know like if you're in the room working with a band and you're all coming up with different parts your musicians that you work with they get on a vibe with you and they know kind of what you like and what you don't like and they offer you like a smorgasbord of things to choose from right and so it's it it feels like i'm working and so like i love when my guitar players come over here to work because we can like jam out stuff and come up with ideas together um i don't pretend like i am like 
scripting every single note that my guitar players play like right. when they do solos and stuff like that that's 100 percent them like any big rock solo unless i was gonna have, say like figure yeah. solos are probably a big thing you give freedom on you're just like absolutely i want you to add a solo okay <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely like in that song we did for lee um there's a bunch of sections there where we open it up for solos um on the summer I forget what what Hypergriff called it, but um, it was a song I did with with Katie George out of Canada, and she like won a Juno for her album. But I caught her right before she won that Juno, so we did that tune for Arc. And I had a really great trombone player um, from um, from Cuba, and she just crushed it. And like I just like she played the parts I sent her, but then I also wanted her to play um improvisation and so what i'll oftentimes do is like on a solo section i'll give that 16 bar eight bar four bar whatever it is to like a few musicians and then i'll just edit the solos the way i want or use little bits of everybody's solo or use one person's solo if it's like exactly what i need so it that surprise like makes makes it so much fun that's kind of cool to think about now when I'm hearing songs that I know you've worked on. I'm going to be like, can I tell if he's chopped together a solo? <laughs> like, I'm going to like, yeah. that's going to be in the back of my head now. And I'm never going to unlook for that. I'm going to be like, I can tell even if I yeah. can't. I won't be able to tell, but I'll try. <laughs> you might be able to. I mean, there's a lot of times where I'm cutting stuff together, um, but I'm definitely like if they if I want them to sound like they're trading fours, I'll edit it so it sounds correct. Um, there's been times where I've where people played wrong notes and I've mm. in solos and I'll fix those. Yeah, just Usually pitch them tell. up, pitch them down. Yeah, because the tech is really good. But I'm very hands on with the production and Arc Knights is very, very particular about the quality. Mm. So they'll call things out if like they're like hearing stuff that's off or hearing pitch problems or hearing articulation problems or like people saying their S is too hard. I'm, I'm, there's been times, especially with that song Awaken we did with Holly Sedios, where mm -hmm. I had to isolate certain segments where she sang and really crank up the de -er or just automate the de -er to hit harder in certain spots because like, you know, opera singers are very into like enunciation. Right. And so unlike with pop singers where you know you're, you can sometimes coax them into giving a lazier performance, opera singers don't, oftentimes have that kind of bend so right. in order to get it to sound more natural i kind of have to mess with it that way i remember um getting vocals from somebody a few years ago i did a band cover with some people and the vocalist was great but there was also just a little bit of like she wasn't quite hitting the notes and i'm just yeah. like i told the guy who was mixing it i'm like don't be afraid to put a little bit of like modulation in there Mm -hmm. auto tuned it up a smidge if you need mm -hmm. to it wasn't again it wasn't bad at all but it was also like some notes you could tell that it's like maybe just on the the cusp of comfort and you're like okay <laughs> maybe yeah. you need a little assistance but that's kind of normal I that's suppose. totally like, normal yeah it's totally normal and also Nobody's like perfect unless you're no. like michael jackson dude was no. nuts. Uh, <laughs> i mean michael jackson was one of the rare but also like like phil collins and those guys they like if you go listen to Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill, which is just absolutely one of the best records ever made in the history of, of alt pop, alt rock, mm -hmm. it is chock full of pitch errors. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's so much about it that's wrong. And that whole era of music, like grunge, rock, alt rock from the 90s that I grew up listening to, nobody did yeah. anything with right. auto tuning. Like I used to think auto tuning was like cheating. Like that's yeah. how bad. But now I'm like, well, everybody does it. You're Guess right. I'm going to do it, you know? And so I end up just doing it on everything because my clients expect it too. Right. Like they want a perfect performance. But also like I'll sit there and I'll be listening and my ears will get tired. And then the next day I'll come back and I'm like, oh, how did I miss all those wrong notes? But, you know, it, it intonation is interesting. And maybe as a drummer you understand this. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But when something is in tune or the musicians have – their chord tuned and together it sounds really close there's like a, a harmonic overtone thing mm -hmm. that happens like a buzzing that you yeah. feel in your body you know that i, mean, I do know yeah for sure so you're probably comfortable with that when it's mm -hmm. off when the intonation is wrong something feels flat like mm -hmm. not polished 
are not shiny. And, and that's the yeah. best way I can describe it. And then when you <laughs> When you tune it, all of a sudden it like locks and it's sparkly and shiny and it's got that like brilliance, you know? And so yeah. I'm looking for that those color tones. But now, um, now that we have the opportunity to color pitches and stuff, we can really focus on quality of, of theatrical nature of the performance rather than just the intonation. Because if I get a really good performance from somebody, oh hell, I'm not gonna erase that in, in right. lieu of better pitch. I'm not I'll going to change it a little up. bit. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I imagine there's a lot of times, and I think kind of like you said, Alanis Morissette, another great example in my mind is Tracy Chapman for that. Yeah. Just beautiful, constant, very real and straightforward. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't like, even if there is a little bit wrong there, yeah. you don't care because you're feeling the music that it's, it's yeah. in like, if a performance is solid enough that you don't mm -hmm. feel you need to, uh, fluff it up by fixing pitch then it's like that's yep. a good song fast yes. car is still one of my all-time favorite tracks just oh, because i it, love that oh, song so good <laughs> hated the country cover i uh, yeah i this. heard it i'm like i see what they're doing but it's just not tracy i can't <laughs> like it, no, there's just something you. that's it, it definitely and, kind of like you were saying you you have to get rid of that color i think that kind of happened with that song it felt too polished it didn't feel I like agree. there was enough reality in it she won. She, I think she won a Grammy for that that year and beat out a bunch of really, really like well-known folks like Mariah Carey level folks. Mm -hmm. And she was kind of a new person. They're like, what? Where'd she come from? And she had that. I don't really know a lot of her other tunes, but Fast Car is so iconic. And I really yeah. love her voice and, and all of that. Um, I think at the time I was listening to... Uh, so there was another artist. What the hell was her name? And her album, Tiger Lily. Wait. Oh, that sounds familiar. Album. I don't know the name. Tiger Lily from the 90s. It was like the same year. Tiger Lily. What album was it? Uh, Natalie Merchant. Oh, okay. I, I That name sounded familiar. Just the yeah. album. I was like, I must have seen that around, heard something from it. I probably have. That was she was like at that time, like Natalie Merchant was my preferred, like she was my favorite. Let me see. Natalie Merchant. Like her, she still puts out songs, but dude, I just 95, man. I love this album so much. And this is the one everybody knows. Oh, yep. I know Thank that you. song. Yep. Yeah. That's probably why I recognize the the album name for some reason. Even if it wasn't on that album, maybe I've just stumbled mm -hmm. across the the um the rabbit hole of looking it up at some point. But I've done that with so many artists and things through the years. Some of them yeah. I forget sometimes, but yeah, yeah I, feel I know that song, that's for sure. Yeah, she's um she's pretty magical, actually, like the way yeah. she writes music. I love that era of songwriting because I feel like people just kinda you know, Did it was music. It was, guitar and vocal and it wasn't about the production now it's like you got to turn on the radio and go wow yeah. what and that's a great snare yeah. they used and right. like all that and it's like another okay. one of my favorite general groups is just blues traveler i love oh, blues yeah. traveler it's, it's like uh, there's something so chill about those guys yeah i like them too <laughs> john popper was just out here doing it or he was not wait no darius rucker was out here john popper's dead no john popper's still around is he, is he alive? Yeah. I thought he died. Oh, he just got like an endorsement a few years ago. Like uh, he got like a, uh, God, what do they call it? A signature harmonica. Like, oh, he did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's kind of, that was awesome. Like when I saw that, I was like, yeah, he deserves, if anyone deserves a signature yeah. harmonica. Oh, for him. Oh, for sure. Yeah. He lost so much weight, man. He really took weight to yeah. taking care of himself. I know he suffered. Maybe that's why he thought he passed. Maybe you were like, "Oh, did he?" I know, I know. <laughs> I, so I, I'm a big Dave Matthews fan. Like mm. he's my favorite, like all time. Carter Beaufort's my favorite drummer, mm. and so I like I love that era of because Popper used to play with Matthews like all the time. They would like tour together, right? That's where I had first heard yeah. Blues Traveler back then, um, but then. What the heck is I, I'm forgetting names. Darius Rucker, who was just here, I was gonna go see him. He was from Hold on. I'm dumb. People probably think of the Darius name. Darius Rucker. 
I know Hootie the name. The I was about to say, I was like, you're forgetting Hootie? <laughs> Hootie and the Blowfish. And, and I don't even, like, them and, they used to play with um, Blues Traveler too. But yeah. I, but they didn't even, like, I didn't even, like, that, it's just a one song. It's the only yep. song that people know. Yep. Right? Everyone knows that song. But mm-hmm. it's like, they have so many. I, I mean, I'm actually happy recently on my local rock station, they've been playing a couple of Hootie songs. I mean, they're still the very popular ones, but yeah. I like that it's just not time. <laughs> for, yeah. for like, for once, finally, there's more. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know, I love that too. And yeah. I think I think music, and that's one of the great things about games like Ark Knights and, and, you know, and as you will soon find out, Rewind, um, I mean, Reverse 1999 is, exposing younger folks to a diverse array of music that they've never heard before is really crucial to keeping, you know, the spirit of new music alive because yeah. I don't know of any other genre or I mean I don't know of any other medium where younger folks can get excited about mid-century rock or 70s pop and like really resonate, you know. Yeah. For like all there's we nothing know. to like lock back to. There's no nostalgia there. They never experienced it. Yes. So like I, I I understand a lot of 90s music, not because I I mean, I was born in 96, so I'm not really like part of that generation, but Oh, the year before I, I graduated high school. Yeah, but it's like I did experience a lot of that music in that initial hindsight. I was very much more into like the the mall punk era of music. I went through like the Slipknot metal phase. And of nice. course I liked Blink-182, you know, like I had all mm-hmm. those intro bands, but I've expanded well beyond it. And that's like, uh, if when I was 17 or so, I was like listening to a lot of ska and like, I found yeah. myself back in that like nineties era and I was learning uh, more about it. And yeah. I'm like, this is so fun. I love it. And like, even like, I don't know if you know the Dropkick Murphys at all. I do. But, yeah. yeah. It's like, I was finding genres like that out and i was like this is sick i don't know why what why does nobody make music like this anymore like i was bummed but i was so glad to be like experiencing that even though it was so much later so having games like that with music that can root back to that raw creative talent i think um i like that's really important in general and that's why i like um like wolfgang van halen doing uh mm-hmm. wbh and mammoth he's yeah it's that is like so much of like a raw like he's just making rock like yeah. <laughs> outright and it's like that's such a good tie back even stuff that's a little bit more controversial like Greta Van Fleet it's like oh that's uh-huh. just you know whatever they're just copying it's like no they're not like let them they let them be this era's Van Halen you know like let mm-hmm. them let them be Zeppelin you know like let yeah. them have that little pocket because while they never got to experience that. Now they could be like, I really like this sound and go look for more and then learn and experience these like prolific acts that made those sounds unique to us yeah. and why we do what we do these days. Well, you know, the the thing that people I think in general have to remember is once music is released, it belongs to everyone. It no longer belongs, I mean, financially it belongs to the artist, but of course. <laughs> there's there's so many songs that everybody knows and loves just as part of their normal daily life, songs that they've grown up with, songs their parents sang to them, songs they heard somewhere, you know, songs that remind them of their first love that they feel ownership over. Mm-hmm. And so it's, I think it's really, um, I think it's really silly and naive for people to say that any style of music is ripping anything off because there's no limits on what you can do with the way that you want to express a certain ideology through music. Like that's, that is what makes it so magical. And, and the fact that you can affect people in a profound way without having ever met them it's like, what is more magical than that? Like, yeah, go eat a McDonald's hamburger and there's so many memories there and that's fine and they're <laughs> delicious and we love them and some people yeah. hate them, but I, you know, it reminds me of being a kid. Like, uh, but, but music does that and, you know, it's so visceral and ephemeral and just like is there and gone. You don't see it or whatever and then, but it affects you in a really profound way. And so all those different styles of music that people are exposed to, it's, 
anytime I hear anybody go, oh, well, that's dated or that's old, but it's absolutely not dated because we are still a hundred years out from not even a hundred years out from rock music. Right. Rock music is not even a hundred years old, dude. Yeah. Like it's well, Elvis and rockabilly was the fifties like that. Yeah. That's not that long ago in like it's the grand not. scheme of music. No. So. And that that was like the roots of it was like blues and rockabilly. And it's like, we just started. <laughs> like, yes. Who knows where we're going to end up? Anybody that wants to learn about the roots of rock music needs to just research Sun Records. Sun Records, I mean, their practices back then where they, where they would underpay musicians but have the same bands play on all those records by Elvis and other folks at the time. They would take songs from other people and just have Elvis sing them and stuff. Mm. He didn't write his music yeah. or most of it or whatever. But Sun Records is a, is a big culprit, culprit of that. And then Tin Pan Alley in the South where like there was no rights for musicians. That's what's going on with, with video game music right now is we don't own the rights of our stuff. And so we don't get the royalties over anything. If I were making royalties off my games, I would have been rich like 10 years ago and been oh, retired, yeah. you know? But, um, but the reality is that like, because this genre, pop, rock, whatever, is so new still, it in the history of of human music it's like we don't we still don't know what we're doing like classical music was a hundred years old like like i said before baroque music there was a couple hundred years there where baroque existed and it didn't change all that much partially because the church didn't let it change i mean we know that the roman catholic church had their vice grip over the neck of you know folks like bach and stuff who were forced to write certain things not counting it for as a sin all of a sudden (laughs) right or the tritone the devil's chord right oh yeah yeah exactly the the artists of those times were still influenced by pop musicians they would go they would go to the bars and hear the troubadours play and pull those influences back to the church music so we would get like real really like non secular is non secular non church i don't remember yeah we get real worldly influences in in church music because those composers were drinking beer at the pub like anybody else where the folk musics and the horn was going you know what i mean like where yeah. people were doing things that were unsavory according to the church so you know we that is all to say that those influences come from so many different places and if Baroque music can last that long, classical music, the Romantic period, you look at all the shifts in the time periods of, of music and they get progressively smaller and smaller. And then you look, oh, there's 80s music and there's 90s music. Oh, but there's early 90s music because that was like the grunge. And then there was alt rock, late 90s. And then we're in the early 2000s. And then we look there and it's like Blink-182. But that was like a three or four year thing. Three or four years in our... <laughs> Hundreds of years of music history. Right. Most people that are alive to experience Elvis Presley have lived through all of rock and pop music. And when you consider that, then we're still in the infancy of what this really means. Right. And like, so, even when you were bringing up the, the tritone thing, it just reminded me that only recently metal showed up and that was seen as like the devil's music. And then yeah. in, in the next 20 years... Bands like Flyleaf and Skillet came out and they're metal and rock that are Christian based. And like there's yeah. a bunch more bands like that. So it's like yeah. there's this shift constantly happening. And within year spans, it's like I've lived in the time it took from uh like metal to be very like shunned in at least my hometown. It was like that's kind of not what we want and our kids to be listening to. Yeah. To the point where like now it's like I love Skrillex. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's I, like I, the- I mean, when I grew up and, and I heard people go, oh, Queensryche is devil's music. And like, yeah. don't listen to Metallica because they worship the devil. No, it's like those bands had a lot of satire and a lot of like social commentary in the yeah. way they were doing things. I mean, and it- Lamb of God is literally based in the social commentary of of religion it's in the name it's basically a parody even one of their music videos is them getting called like by a parent who's like we need some christian music for our child's birthday party and it's this like five-year-old girl and like oh let's go with lamb of god they sound like a very christian band they show up and they're just playing that's (laughs) awesome like that's the joke of the video that's the point though it's like Mm -hmm. you can make these social commentaries be it religious or political and not feel this like grandiose better holier than thou sensation of like these are people who have opinions and are just 
give, getting them out rather mm. than needing to be like made into some huge debacle. Like they, they used to make it huge on media, but nowadays a, a new metal record drops and Fox news doesn't care. You know, no. there's other things to focus on. Whereas like 20 years ago, they were like, how could they, or video games yeah. ruin, running our kids lives, you know, like yeah. they're teaching bad habits and all yeah. of that. While that still does happen sometimes mm -hmm. th this, huge shift in like what is becoming focus and like i'm glad that it's not sitting here being stuck with music because yeah. it's becoming this it almost went from like wild west to this very like oh we don't want to like make waves we're just going to do our thing but then rock especially has always been just like we don't care who do you think you are <laughs> like, i love oh. that it's changed so much now the only thing we have to worry about is alien disclosure so <laughs> yeah <let's... laughs> oh okay i totally forgot i have a few questions actually yeah uh people on my patreon wanted to ask one of them is an absolute meme question but i'm going to ask it anyway it is not ask appropriate it. but i will leave it in just for the sake of seeing if there's an answer to be had um da, 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 there they are okay so you want the serious one or the joke one first <laughs> <laughs> well get the joke one let's do that one first all right okay <laughs> Imagine if your current toilet was replaced with two toilets and they have the ability to speak. One of them wants you to use it. It gains pleasure in receiving your stool and praises you while you do it. The other does not want you to use it. It begs for mercy. And it has, if it had eyes, it would be crying. Which toilet are you shitting in? <laughs> uh, I told you it was one, ridiculous. Which one is further from the door? <laughs> So it's like That's, it doesn't matter if it's begging for it or if you or if it's crying. You're like, I mean, I, mean, <laughs> I that that sounds kind of like I wouldn't want to hurt anybody, right? But also so it's a I, toilet. But like, I would never go pee pee poo poo on you <laughs> if you didn't want me to. <laughs> My answer to that was like, I'm going outside. Like, I I can't. <laughs> like, if I had no, my to answer, pick one, my answer is oh. this. Talking toilets, holy shit! <laughs> it's like that. I mean, uh, what? Yeah, whoever asked that, they don't get to be on your Patreon anymore. I'm kidding. No, <laughs> don't say that. He's a good person. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I was wild. like, okay, that's yep. He also did. Pre oh. <laughs> he did preface that way. with like, I have no idea if Mr. Gummin would be into this humor, but here's my favorite <laughs> question. <laughs> Uh, well, I was like, I guess we'll find am. out. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is and just you know. a much more straightforward of like, uh, how can a bedroom composer get better at making things like improving mood, uh, which books, courses, instruments, practices in your DAW, et cetera. What would be actionable tips that yeah, to, to get better at composing? Yeah. Well, number one, the easy answer is just do it more do it yeah. more try to do sound alikes i think i learned so much when i worked on um especially for pop production i learned so much when i worked on karaoke revolution and um just dance kids for ubisoft years ago that was probably like 12 13 years ago and being able to like listen to those scores from karaoke revolution and and like reproduce all of bohemian rhapsody note for note to match the tempo to match every single note of that song to create an exact replica that lines up when you play it over the original was really cool and it taught me so much about the way that people think about music so score study for me as a classical composer score study is wonderful but if you can go do a sound alike or a rescore of a trailer that gives you a lot of opportunity to both explore and to live um, uh, some standards. You know what I mean? You don't have to have a lot of gear to be a good composer. I got by for so many years off of just basic stuff. Um, it wasn't until I really started to make money that I started to invest. And I don't know if I'm any better because of it. I think I understand how to use gear better. Um, if you're a, if you're a composer that is working at home primarily. It's really important that you understand the power of less when it comes to effect chains. So for example, because 
you know, a lot of us that are composers also have to be producers and engineers and we have to do all the, all the things, wear all the hats. Understanding how to use a compressor properly, like compressor is my best friend when it comes to getting a pop sound, to be able to, to parallel compress vocals into getting that really nice sound, to be able to like um, set up a, a gain staging properly for a microphone so you get like the most juice out of it without distorting. Like that's all really important stuff. Um, most of my sound comes from compression and EQ, not from crazy effects. I use reverb and delay judiciously. I'm very cautious when I use them because people can just bathe their music in it and think that it sounds good and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So even orchestral stuff, if you listen to my orchestral scores from Arc Nights in particular, I am using one reverb for all the strings and I just lightly tap it. I don't do any crazy processing. I let all the compressors do the work and I don't even use that many compressors. Even on that stuff, I'm, I'm using basically what comes in the box. So balance and all that is really key. But if you're really trying to get better just by working at home and, and you're a hobbyist, then doing it more is the only answer. And by doing it more, you're going to start to hear up levels. Like that's the best way that I can describe it is like you start to hear what the next level's like listening to music and comparing your work to other people's work it'll give you what like a glimpse through an open door of what the next level is i'm sure you feel that same way about drumming when you get so good at drumming you plateau and you're like where do i go and yep. then you start listening more and you're like oh he did a paradiddle double pedal thing that i'd never heard before i'm gonna practice that or you're like whoa listen to the way that you know way that the beat flips or like you know when you listen to somebody's work and it impresses you and you wish you could do that then that is the next level i can't tell you how many times i went through that when i was doing wolfmaster that entire drum yeah. cover was like over a month of me trying to go like okay how did this like solo part work how did that like breakdown section in the middle that like really fun jazzy bit and i'm like how does any of that happen and i was like really working it out day in day out for i would say a week straight before i was like really comfortable with like how i was doing it and even then yeah. i was still not happy with my end result knowing that if uh, again with the acoustic kit if i had one then it would have been slightly better because i would have had more room to play with could have used more like with the rim like there's just different ways to hit that i couldn't do yeah. and i was like mm, i'm limited yeah. by my tools but that's one of those rare ex uh examples like where you said tools aren't that important whereas like on an acoustic kit the difference yeah. between the two are so broad and the sure. abilities of both are so unique that it's like I can play on the one, but there's just so much loss of exactly what dynamic sound you want to get. Like I can't do uh, rim shots on this kit, for example. Mm -hmm. It's like so many times I try and I'm like, oh, that's right. I can't hit the rim and the snare at the same time. Stuff yeah, I like feel that. that. I feel that when I programmed that, that was one of the things because I programmed that beat and then I sent it to Adam and he transcribed it and then he just made it so much better by having all those cool dynamic little things in there. Yeah. You know? and, just I mean, playing around on that ride symbol. I was like, bro, <laughs> okay, yeah, I see what he, he's doing. He did a good job with that. I, I find that sometimes I'll program too complex stuff that cannot be played. So he has to like fix it because obviously I'm a piano player, not a drummer. Right. So, I, but I try to think like a people do that. They'll actually like write drum parts. That's like, you physically can't do that with two hands. No, you cannot. <laughs> and then you have well, he to, does like, overdubs for me. Right. So on a lot of it, you know, like he'll overdub parts. Like he'll send me like a uh, Tom overdubs when I have a Tom part that's like rolling while, while beats going on, he'll do that. Mm. But also, like for that song, especially that middle section, having all the instruments play unison was so, I'd never done that before. Like I'd never done all the brass unison with electric guitar and not tuned anything. And that's how I got that sound because I wanted everybody to be really raw. Da -da 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 -da. Like that was like really hard for the trumpet player to keep up on because fingering wise, it was really mm -hmm. challenging. Easy for sax, not easy on trombone at all. Like he had- <laughs> But it sounded really so crunchy and good it. at the end. So it's like- Well, I fed everything through one compressor. Mm -hmm. And then I, I had the, I had slightly overdriven the compressor on the on the brass to get that sound mm, and because okay. I, you know I, I think i used rc20 to color it just a little bit more vintage because i wanted it to feel like one mic so i used the rc20 plugin on that and then i just i used the cola plugin the cola compressor from acoustica audio and i just cranked it so it, it like really pushed and and when you can overdrive those analog plugins they kind of give you a little heat and then my guitar yeah. player just played distorted 
And so like all that together, like gave me that really cool sound. So I was able to put all that in the middle and then the drums were really wide and the bass was live too. So having all that together, the drums filled up the landscape, mm. you know, and that's why he was allowed to do so much because everything else is really narrow and tight. And right. that, that's kind of how I got that sound. But anyway, part, part of my uh, process of like learning that part of the drums, I was like, this, is, this part feels like I'm on a train. Right. Like it feels like I, I'm doing like a fight in the middle of a train. Like it's it cool. was a really weird mental space. And I was like, maybe that's now hearing that. I'm like, yeah, that tracks. Cause then it's like that that was a bad pun. I didn't even intend for that. Uh <laughs> but I was like, that that fits with uh the whole like everything feeling compressed in the center and then the drums being wide. It's like that's the body and the wheels of the tray, and there's just this huge sound just barreling through. But, you know what that song is a uh, is um, a sound alike of, right? No. Uh... So they the temp for that. Let me see if I can find it. King Crimson's Twenty uh, First Century Schizoid Man. Oh, that is what oh. they that is what they'd sent me for that, and mm-hmm. and it's not even the same. No. It's not even the same rhythm. But they had a horn line where they just like this dent 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 yeah. like over and over again, right? I so definitely I like that. I feel that inspiration for sure coming from that. Yeah. And so they liked this song. And but that dent but what I did was dun 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 it's like one what what dun, 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 two three one it's like six eight right but mm-hmm. but I changed the time I changed the rhythm of it so it's yeah slowed thanks down. for that and then and then we sped up so I just wrote a way more complicated line yeah and then I also wanted it to go somewhere so I did that Latin riff and I love that where you like do a riff then take part of it and repeat it and repeat it it's like saying a sentence it's like hey buddy how are you how are you how are you how are you hey buddy how are you hey buddy 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 so you're taking parts of that same sentence and then repeating it you know, as a motif. And that to me is composition when you can just take something and just like reorganize it and relay out the tiles to create a new picture. Anyway, yeah, I got to um, go. My kid's yeah. uh, get, dance teacher is going to be here any minute. But get out let's of do here. this again. <laughs> yeah. Let's do this By again. Anytime, man. This right, is fun. And good to actually for, finally talk to you, man. Yeah. It's been, we ha- we've been talking for a minute just in text and it's like. Yeah. yeah. But anyway. Now we did this. Go. All right, buddy. Have a great rest of your night, and I can't wait to see what you do with all this crazy talk that I gave you. So, yeah, so thank you very much again. Take it easy, Rob. Bye.